We are going to continue our discussion about continuous uh, extensions. Um, and we're going to talk about the multilinear extension. So this is where we are so far in terms of past lectures and, and how this uh, fits in. So uh, in the previous lectures, we defined the convex closure and the concave closure obviously with the intention of minimizing or maximizing respectively. And uh, these have these require an exponential number of variables even to define. Uh, if you recall from those past lectures, the evaluation requires us to, to look at all possible uh, convex decompositions of any point inside the unit cube and, uh, and to choose the one that, has, that gives us the best value. That's essentially what it is, and that, and that would take exponential effort even for evaluation, uh, let alone for, uh, for, for minimizing. And then we found that the, that the convex closure, this coincides with the Lovas extension when f is submodular. And the Lovas extension didn't a priori have any nice properties like convexity or concavity, but it's always easy to evaluate. But this is not the case for uh, the concave uh, closure. Um, so, so we need something else. And this is where the multilinear extension comes in. So this is, uh, in general, hard to evaluate even for submodular functions. So it's, it's material substantially different from, from uh, the, the, the convex closure. So this is uh, the, the motivation for defining a different continuous extension that will allow us to, uh, to maximize submodular functions is the motivation for this multilinear extension. And this is what we'll be developing in this and, and subsequent lectures. So the idea is, uh, is the following. How else could we uh, given a point x in the unit cube, let's see, we can even just think, how would we uh, evaluate it given a um, given all we have is a set function? So let's let's actually before we give the definition, do, just do that thought experiment. So we're we're given f, which maps corners of the cube. And we want to know uh, how, what are possible natural ways to extend to zero, one, oops, to the, to the E. This is our, our basic question. And, and one natural thought is let's interpret X as a probability. So let's interpret any X in 0, 1 to the e as a uh, product distribution on e elements, as an independent, in other words, let me write it more clearly, uh, as a product distribution on e elements. In other words, xi is the probability that we choose element i to be in our, in our set. And then we could define f of x to just be the expected value of f of the point x hat, where x hat, x hat is drawn according to x. In other words, the probability that x hat i equals 1 is just equal to the coefficient xi. So this is a natural way to, with, with randomness, to, to, to interpret x uh, and, and, and to turn x into uh, something that we can sample from and sample corners of, of the cube. This is exactly the multilinear extension, and we're going to use this notation. So let's, let's, so let's now define that. Um, now that we have, have this pretty natural, natural idea. 
So the multilinear extension is defined uh, as follows. Again, given f as above, f, which I could either, you know, I'll write 0, 1, is our function, we'll define our function f of x, where x is any element in the unit cube, to be, again, an exponential sum, so sum over all subsets, f of s times the product that i is an s xi times the product of j not in s of 1 minus xj. And you can see that what I did, what I wrote here, is exactly the probability that I would sample the set s if I used probabilities x and you know, sampled each element i in an independent way according to, uh, according to xi. So, so this multilinear extension exactly has uh, has this this property. So rather than writing it again, let me uh, let me just highlight it. So so this is indeed what uh, what interpretation this has, and, and it will be fruitful for us to to use that interpretation just in terms of, of thinking about it. This has several properties. By itself, it is not convex or uh, or, or concave, but uh, it does have, as we'll see, a number of, of useful properties, including some simultaneous convexity and concavity properties. Again, in the, in, in the presence of, of either monotonicity or submodularity or, or potentially both. So uh, this lemma lays down some, some first properties of uh, the multilinear extension. If f is monotone, then the partial derivatives of its multilinear extension are all non-negative. This is this should be it's natural. Uh, so the partial derivatives of f are all non-negative for all i and for all x in the unit cube. Nope. Now note that I'm just assuming monotonicity. So uh, not assuming simultaneous monotone and submodular unless I, unless I say so. Now if f is submodular without re any requirement for, for monotonicity, then its second partial derivatives with respect to xi and xj. So its second partial derivatives with respect to xi is equal to zero. And you, can, you can see that by, by straightforward calculation. Actually, maybe we just turn back and, and, have, and have a look just to, just to remind ourselves of, of that. So if you, if you look at this function, let me write it down here. Note that the second derivative of f with respect to any xi is equal to zero. And that's just because it, indeed it's multilinear. So it's, it's linear in each of the xi. So second derivative with respect to each, any, any xi is, is zero. But it, uh, if f is submodular, then the second, the second partial derivative with respect to xi and xj is less than or equal to zero, again, for any i and j and for any x in the unit cube. So let's see a proof of, uh, of these two uh, of these two properties. We'll prove one on, on this slide and then we'll continue with the proof of, of the second property on the, on the next slide, but it's really uh, the, the same idea. And we'll see how this uh, expectation interpretation helps us helps us think through this. Now let's just take the let's just take the derivative of, of uh, this function. Um, and we can do that just by noting that you know, I can write f of x, this is just copying from the previous slide. This is this times the product of xi for i in s times the product of 1 minus xj for every j not in s. And so if I'm interested in fixing a particular, a particular i, then I can uh, write this 
just so we can make the taking the derivative a little bit a little bit more straightforward, a little bit easier. This is a sum, I'll break it down as a sum over all subsets of E um, where that contain that element. Since I've got a lot of I's and J's floating around, I'm going to use a K. So this is a sum over all S, but where, uh, where K is contained in I, and then I'll have the, the remainder, the sum over all the other elements that, that where S does not contain I. So this is this times the product of um, I in S, but excluding element K. I'm just going to separate that out as a product of uh, J not in S of 1 minus xj. So it's all of this thing times xk. Now my whole point in writing this is that it will make it easier to take a partial, a partial derivative. Um, and then I'll do the, the same thing here times, this is plus the sum over all s where uh, such that k is not an element of s. And what's going to happen here is instead of an xk coming out, I'll have a 1 minus xk coming out. So f of s times the product of xi, i in s times the product of um, j not in s and j not equal to k of 1 minus xj. And in the same way, I've got my final term, 1 minus uh, xk. And so now, the partial derivative of f with respect to this xk that I've singled out is, is, is easy to evaluate because uh, it is basically, uh, it's equal to the difference of two terms. f of um, everything except for the kth coordinate and then the kth coordinate set to one. And you can see that that's just the derivative of this first, of this first term minus f with everything except for this kth coordinate and this kth coordinate set to zero. So just to be clear here, I'm trying to save, uh, be a little bit lazy on notation. Uh, what, I mean by, what I mean by this term is f of x1, x2, x3, xk minus one, and then instead of xk, I'll write one, and then xk plus one, etc. So it's equal to this, but now, what is uh, what is what is uh, what is this? Remember, what is the interpretation of f of x? It is the expected value um, of little f of the sets drawn according to x. So, if I sample according to this property, I'm basically just guaranteeing that element k is going to be in my set. So, in other words, this is the expected value of f evaluated at some set R, which definitely has element K. And then by the same token, this is F of uh, R, and the distribution for all elements that aren't K are, are the same. That's why I'm using it. I'm keeping it inside the same expectation. Uh, and But R definitely does not have uh, K. And what is it that we want to show? Uh, property one says that this is non-negative in the event that f is monotone. And, and we see that now that this is straightforward because whatever r is, I'm evaluating it at r plus k minus r minus k. So by monotonicity, this every term inside the expectation and hence the expectation itself will, uh, will be non-negative. And again, to be clear here, r is a subset of the ground set E and it's random such that element i is in R with probability xi. Okay, so this, so we've now uh, proved property one. So let's uh, let's let's turn to the to the second uh, to the second property, and the proof is actually pretty similar. Um, the proof of two is similar. Now, we just computed these partials. We're going to now take the, the derivative of, of, of each of the partials. And you can see that, this, that the partial derivative, which uh, 
is again going to be multilinear, and that's the key. So uh, all of these partials are also multilinear. Mul multilinear. Um, and they have the same form, except that xj is set to one and zero. So with respect to all of the other all of the other variables, uh, all of the, except for xi, pardon me, not xj, uh, they they have the same form. Um, so and by similar calculation, we can find that the second derivative of f with respect to xi and xj. This is again just the partial derivative with respect to uh, xj evaluated at, I'll write it out this time, x1, xi minus 1, 1, xi plus 1, all the way up to xe, minus the partial derivative of f with respect to xj x1, xi minus 1, xi is now set to 0, xi plus 1, xe. And from here we can see that this is, again, by the same reasoning as above, this first term is equal to the expected value of f of r, where r is sampled according to x, but I make sure that R has both I and J. If it already had it, that's great, but I, I can add it. Minus F of R union I minus J. That's the first term. Again, exactly by the same, by the same reasoning as we did, the same calculation as in the previous slide. And then the second term is, is very similar. It's expected value of f of r, but notice now that uh, i is always is always missing. So uh, I look at r minus i union j minus f of r minus both i and j. And these set minus operations obviously are, are legitimate even if uh, R does not contain uh, does not contain I and J, but you can see that what this is exactly is uh, this is this is the expected value of the marginal value of F with respect to R union I of element J because here I'm looking at the additional value I get when I already have R union I of adding J or not adding J. And this is the marginal value of j compared to the set where I definitely don't have i. And so now we're not using monotonicity anywhere, but what we are using is submodularity. And what we know is that marginal values decrease as my set gets bigger. In other words, this value for any realization of R is greater than or equal to this first value, making this an average of non-positive values and hence uh, something that's non-negative. So what have we proved so far? We've proved that if F is monotone, little f is monotone, no, don't need submodularity, then the gradients, then the, the partial derivatives are uh, non-negative. In other words, the gradient would be all non-negative vectors. And also, uh, or rather separately, if uh, without any need for monotonicity, if f is little f is submodular, then the second derivatives are all non-positive. So we get some immediate consequences of, uh, of, of those two. So I'll write these as a, as a corollary. And I've, I've called the, the title of the slide convexity and concavity properties exactly because now I want to leverage those component-wise properties into, uh, into convexity and, and concavity properties. So, well, first of all, if F is monotone, 
This means that the function f is, is non-decreasing along any direction that's non-negative. So if I start from any x and I move anywhere from it in the, in the positive orthant, then, uh, th then my function only increases. So f is non-decreasing along any direction d that is uh, non-negative. Next, if x is submodular, then this implies that f is concave along any d that's not negative. So what I mean is if I look at the uh, univariate function, uh, say g of t, where g of t is equal to f of x plus t times d, then this is a concave function as long as uh, the, the vector d is component-wise non-negative. And then the interesting aspect is that, uh, that, the, the, that the multilinear extension doesn't just have concave, concavity properties. If f is submodular, then f is convex along all directions d that are equal to ei minus ej. And uh, the proof of, of, of these is, is, is straightforward, but let's, uh, we might as well see, we might as well see, uh, see it in action. So let's let, for all of these, phi of um, t equal f of x plus t times d. So all of these are assertions about the function uh, phi. So uh, no. the derivative, oops, not epsilon. Um, phi prime of t, just uh, write, writing what this is, uh, by the chain rule, this is the sum of di times the gradient of f with respect to xi evaluated at x plus t times d. So we know uh, that if we have monotonicity, then the, the, the gradient is component-wise non-negative. And therefore, if, if d is non-negative, then clearly this is non-negative. So one follows um, since this is not negative and di is not negative. Now let's look at uh, now the second derivative in order to talk about the second, the second two, uh, the second two properties. So again, using the chain rule, the second derivative is going to have a di times dj times the second derivatives double partial with respect to i and with respect to j, evaluated at x plus t d. And again, by the same reasoning, we know that if, if f is uh, submodular, then we know that these partial derivatives are all non-positive. So if the di's are all non-negative, then product of non-negative and non-positive has to be non-positive. The second derivative is non-positive uh, everywhere, which is exactly concavity. So two follows since, again, I'm not writing monotonicity up top and here because they're stated in, in, in the statement of the corollary. Xi, Xj less than or equal to zero and Di is non-negative. So, uh, so that's property two. So now let's look at the, the third property. And again, it's gonna, it's gonna follow from this, this calculation that we did because if d is equal to ei minus ej, that means that it's just the, it's the vector that has a one in the i location, a minus one in the j location, and zeros everywhere else. So what is gonna survive in this, in this double summation? It's uh, the only thing that's gonna survive is the, ter the terms where i equals j. I guess that's confusing here. I should have probably written, let's write this as l and k. So the only terms in the sum are when 
i equals j equals l, and when i equals j equals k. So those are the only two terms, and if I write out the two terms that survive, this is equal to the second derivative of f with respect to, oops, uh, with respect to xi squared, evaluated at x plus td, times, uh, times d, I should write, this is l, times dl uh, squared, dl times dl, which is, which is one, so it's, it's equal to this term, minus twice the second derivative with respect to l and with respect to k, evaluated at x plus td, plus the second derivative with respect to xk at x plus td. Again, we already said that f is, f is uh, linear in individually in each of the xi, so the second derivatives go to zero, and uh, we're left with this term. And what do we know about this term? Well, by submodularity, which is the assumption in the, in the third property here, we know that the second derivative is non-positive. And if the second derivative is non-positive and I have a minus two, then this whole term therefore is greater than or equal to zero, and hence uh, three follows. So, uh, so far so good. So now, so we now understand a number of properties of uh, this multilinear extension. But you may fairly ask, how uh, do we evaluate? Because let's flip back to where I where I wrote down what this uh, what the what the multilinear extension is. And we're and when I say evaluate, you know, we're assuming that f, of course, is given with an oracle where you give it a set s and it returns the value little f of s. Because if I have to specify little f by writing down all exponentially many of its values, then everything is gonna be linear in, in that description length. So we're really interested in how many evaluations do we need when we're talking about complexity. And, and so you can see here that there's really no way, no way around it. If, you, if I give you any particular x, you may need to, in order to evaluate the sum, you may need uh, exponentially many um, evaluations. So, uh, so, um, so the point is that uh, we cannot evaluate the multilinear extension exactly efficiently. Um, and again, efficiently means a polynomial number of evaluations of f of s. So that's a problem. So instead, we're going to show, again through this expectation interpretation, that we can evaluate it with high probability very accurately. So we can evaluate it approximately. Since, again, we know that f of x is equal to the expected value of f of x hat, again, where x hat is drawn according to x, we can evaluate this expectation by sampling, so by taking i, i, d, samples and averaging. And then using a Chernoff bound or, 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 or hoofding. So uh, indeed, let's, let's, do the, let's do the following. Let's again, as, as always, let R be sampled. Let R I be sampled I I D according to X. Let's let M be, give us the upper and lower bounds 
So I'm assuming that I know M or I have an upper bound on M. And so what that means is that F of R is a random variable in minus M to M. And therefore, if I just sample uh, IID, this, this variable F of R, in average, then I can use uh, Huffding's bound with, with, uh, with a random variable in, in minus M to M. So put, putting in a few of these details, let's let uh, ZI equal the normalized random variable. So I'm, I'm normalizing this. So now it takes values in, in minus one to one. So then by Huffding or, or, or Chernoff, then this basically tells me that if I'm averaging IID draws, then Uh, if I i equals one, if I if I have, if I sum t of these and compare them to t times f of x, the probability that this is bigger than t times some epsilon decays like e to the minus t epsilon squared over four. This is basically churn off, churn off bound. Um, and, and so basically what we, what we just showed is, uh, is, the following, is the following lemma that, just writing it out, if we sample R1 to RT, IID, according to X, then if I look at this quantity, the average of the sum of f of ri compared to what I wish to evaluate, this is going to be less than epsilon times whatever that capital M was. In other words, max, um, max f of s. And it's, it's going to be that good uh, with probability that's, that's uh, exponentially close to one. One minus e to the minus, um, uh, minus um, t epsilon squared over four. So this tells us that while we can't evaluate exactly, we can, uh, we, we can indeed um, evaluate approximately. What we have left to do now is talk about how we can uh, optimize, in particular, how we can maximize this, uh, this multilinear extension. And uh, we're going to turn to that in the next lecture.